Hi, I'm James Verdier, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. For today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Mary Hagedorn, Senior Research Scientist at the Smithsonian National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. She also has a laboratory at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, from which she joined me to chat. We talked today about her just published article in Bioscience, which proposes the idea of creating a passive biorepository in a location that I never would have guessed the moon. Uh, but I'll let her tell you all about that. So with no further ado, let's go straight to the interview. Thank you very much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, James. Thank you for inviting me. The pleasure's all ours. Um, to get us started, though, I was thinking we might talk a little bit about what a biorepository is. And I guess we could also start with the question of, you know, why do we need these things? What does a biorepository do for us? It's a great question. And, um, you know, I think that we've had these things for thousands of years, we call generally called them seed banks of some sort, you know, and farmers and of all sorts have put aside seeds for thousands of years. And um, so for animals, we often call them biobanks or biorepositories, and they've been available to us for a much shorter period of time, um, only really since the mid 1950s or so, where we could cryopreserve, and that means um, cooling animal cells or even plant cells or microbes down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, which is about um, one um, minus 200 degrees centigrade or minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit or so, and um, where they remain frozen but alive and they can stay alive for many, many years, decades. Um, and so these repositories are really important because like for our seeds, they are a backup for our our ecosystems and our and, and our survival here on Earth. Uh, our agriculture is very dependent on seeds. If we lose um, crops because of um, hurricanes or whatever might happen during a natural disaster, seeds can then be used in the following months to replace what has been lost. It's also true for biorepositories. We uh, use biorepositories of all types, um, either uh, for wildlife or for human tissues and cells in medicine. And you know, um, there's just a wide variety of biorepositories that are available to us um, because we can now um, cryopreserve things in liquid nitrogen. Okay, and this is painfully obvious, but uh, is the reason we do the cryopreservation with animals versus the seed preservation because animals don't store as well as seeds do? Seeds are kind of you know up to that task inherently, right? Oh, in in a sense, yes. Um, uh, it, yes, the seeds you can dry. So sure. it's been very easy for thousands of years to, you know, sort of put seeds in a dry area um, on a shelf, you know, um, somewhere where they wouldn't get damp. And they, they slowly dry down and they can, I mean, they found seeds in, you know, pharaoh's tombs and things like that and have been able to sprout them. So they're viable. Some seeds are viable for many thousands of years um, if they're, they're dried properly. Um, and we have one of the largest seed repositories in the world at the USDA in Fort Collins. And um, it, it has just um, millions of seeds. And um, the animal animal cells um, and some plant cells and microbes have to be uh, cryopreserved, which is a process where you pull out the water specifically using um, antifreeze. It's a kind of, they're sugars um, like antifreeze. And so it's that it's that solution that's drying them instead of the air. Seeds dry in the air very, very slowly over time, and they can tolerate that. Most cells cannot. Some cells can actually. Um, tardigrades can can do that. Um, brine shrimp can do that. So there are a few animals that can do it, but there's they're very few and far between. Most need help, um, and and it is these solutions that we use. We call cryoprotectants, and, but they're really antifreeze, the same thing you put in your car, really, um, to keep it from freezing or, or overheating. Um, and it is these, these solutions that help draw out the water, and then they, they, they can enter the cell and stop ice crystals from forming. And what you don't want to have happen when you are uh, cryopreserving um, a cell or a tissue is you don't want ice crystals to form because those can damage the cells. Think of them as small spears going through the membranes and, you know, sort of making a mush of everything. Um, and you and you really don't want that. And that, I mean, think of um, when you when we do this, um, human fertility clinics do an amazing job at, at keeping human embryos alive, you know, and, and um, viable. And it is this this very amazingly painstaking process of cryopreservation that we use to keep those um, embryos alive and, and then viable and, and 
turning into a human. Okay, and, and is the need for you know this cryopreservation and you know and banking of samples is that more dire now than perhaps it you know had been say a hundred years ago or something like that? Is there increased urgency? Well, I, it's hard to know. <laughs> I think from my perspective okay. <laughs> it probably is. Um, sure. I, you know, I think I think certainly, um, and I'll, I'll start with humans because you know humans are having you know larger problems with fertility. So um, cryopreservation is important for humans and humans have different lifestyles than they, than they did a hundred years ago. Women are delaying um, ha having families and so they um, ne often need assistance in, in having those families and uh, the cryopreservation of, of, of sperm and eggs and embryos can really offset um, those those changes in, in, in professions and lifestyles. Um, for, for animals, definitely, because we are impacting many ecosystems uh, by changing the you know climates and um or climate and which is changing how animals are living and whether they're surviving and so um many times many many animal systems now absolutely need the help and you'll see that very um uh sort of immediately this summer um in the caribbean as the caribbean really begins to warm uh, there will be large scale loss of uh, or or damage, let's let's say that damage to especially in, in the area around Miami and Florida um, to those ecosystems as it happened last year. And um, what happens is you start to lose individuals and populations. They are no longer able to reproduce as well. And so, um, if you can, if you have those genes frozen down or those individuals frozen down, whether it's in sperm or larvae or whatever it might be, you can reinfuse those populations back with that diversity and and the thing that's it the thing that's very critical to life on earth is biodiversity it is it is our riches it is you know when you think of going into some of the, the most amazing museums on earth and you see you know just incredible things that people have created and sculpted and painted and you know uh, just uh, it's amazing to see over time that is what bi biodiversity is to our survival on on the planet and as we lose biodiversity because we are infringing on ecosystems, whether it's because of toxins or pollution, or, um, whatever it may be, it is the, it is a huge loss in th their ability to function and our ability to survive on this earth. Okay, so you've completely sold me on the, the necessity of, of having these biorepositories. Um, but now as <laughs> we move into, uh, you know, one of the, the titular items in, the, in your article, uh, why would we put one on the moon? Another good question. So um, there is in a way, it's it's a, a it's an homage <laughs> to Svalbard, and Svalbard is the the seed vault that that um, uh, a, a consortium of people created in Norway, and it was an old mine that is that was in the um, in the Arctic, and dug down um, you know say four hundred feet or so below the the tundra, and it holds seeds at a perfect temperature. Now, if you go to visit uh, the USDA um, seed bank. Um, you'll you'll walk into to um, these massive rooms that are held at minus 18 degrees centigrade because it can hold seeds forever at that temperature. It's just the perfect temperature. And that's what Svalbard is without having to put any energy in. You don't need electricity, you don't need anything. And so it's it's they, they call it a, a fail safe because it, it's a backup repository. If every other repository on earth, seed repository on earth were to fail because of um, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, fires, who knows, you know, many things can damage biorepositories. And um, so Svalbard is that passive, we just leave it there and we don't do anything unless we absolutely need it. There is no place on earth that is cold enough to do that for animal and plant cells, certain plant cells. We have to cryopreserve something and, you know, have them at liquid nitrogen temperatures. There's no place on earth that's cold enough. And um, you know, we thought about space, you know, just going into space and like ISS, for instance, the International Space um, Station. But um, the ISS is held in low Earth orbit. And that is what um, the atmosphere of a planet is the thing that keeps um, radiation from damaging us. And, and you know, think back. Um, some people may remember when um, our ozone layer was being damaged. And um, that was just because of certain chemicals in the atmosphere. And we were able to stop the use in, of those chemicals and replace them with something else. And the ozone layer closed up. But during that interim, when the, when the ozone layer was um, being damaged, the, the places like in, in um, sp especially South Australia, 
a lot of animals and people got skin cancers um, because of that loss in protection of our ozone layer. So our atmosphere, our ozone layer protect us from radiation. And the ISS is in, in low Earth orbit and it many of the, of the uh, people are protected because of that, but they're not completely protected and they're not there that long. They, you also have to put a lot of energy to keep the ISS up because it is in low Earth orbit and it will be um, cycling down in the next 10 years or so. So um, the ISS or anything like that in low Earth orbit to protect the, the samples wouldn't really work long term because of the need for energy and the long term ac accumulation of radiation that might happen in the ISS. Um, and then you could say, okay, well, how about if we just go out further and just do a satellite that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about that it, it goes around the Earth. But then you do have to worry about radiation it, and it accumulates over time. You have both solar radiation, which we've just experienced in that huge solar flare. Um, that happened what two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, and um, but also then we have celestial radiation. Um, the um, so the next logical place would be the moon, and the moon is um, we are going to the moon. We have many projects. Many countries have many projects. Ours um, at, in the U.S. is the Artemis that is started, and um, people will be on the moon. We'll be working on the moon, and the only way to protect people on the moon is to um, dig them in, you know, um, they have to, you, to protect um, animal cells or people or whatever, that you need about two meters of dirt. <laughs> it's called regular on the moon. <laughs> and um, so th the idea that we could potentially do this on the moon and protect cells from radiation if we dug them in was attractive. And then we looked, uh, you know, on the moon and we saw that there were areas that they're called permanently shadowed regions. And the, the, the largest ones are on the south pole of the moon. And these areas never get sunlight. And um, they're, they're large craters. Some are shallower, some are deeper. Um, Shackleton's crater is um, almost four miles deep. Um, and so, but they are liquid nitrogen temperatures because they never get any light. And so they're perfect in that regard. I mean, there's many issues about, you know, how we would do this and, you know, just the physical doing of, of it. But, um, you know, Barring any issues with governance and any issues with, um, uh, you know, sort of policy uh, from NASA and other other um, agencies around the world, they might be a perfect place. Uh, they're not perfect in that it's difficult to work at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Um, even robots, think of cars that seize up after, um, you know, minus 50 degrees, you know, like in Alaska and places like that. It's really hard for, for even robots to work at those temperatures. But um, having said all that, um, that I think one of the, the, the larger things we, we'd have to deal with is water. Many of these permanently shadowed regions have water of some type, we believe, in them. And um, water is very valuable on the moon, not only because it will help uh, people who are going to live and work on the moon or in um, uh, Earth, you know, sort of space exploration, but it's also fuel. Um, so uh, it's, it, and many uh, sort of sort of astronomers and 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 astro astrophysicists and biologists astrobiologists i guess is the correct term are very interested in how the moon was formed and uh the water uh, can tell you if it has the same signatures as water on earth so if it has the same signatures that means it originated on earth and if it doesn't then it came from someplace else and contaminating it is of of course a problem so it, there are many, many things that that are, you know, sort of an, are issues. But I think as we think about this and and trying to have to maintain the, the incredible um, biodiversity that we have on our planet, the moon is our, our and we don't and that we don't want to have to put a lot of energy into it. The moon is our safest bet um, to, do, to do that. Yeah. And it's the reason why, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, I think the element about avoiding the need for or about avoiding radiation rather makes perfect sense because you know obviously it would destroy the samples is the need to avoid the use of energy because um you know you want this repository to persist um you know in in case of some cataclysm on earth or or something like that um yes I, you know i i live in hawaii or i live and work in hawaii and you know it really we, we live on a rock in the middle of the ocean and i just recently lost my entire bank um and I live in a fairly sophisticated industrial area where we right. can get things pretty quickly, but we couldn't get things quickly enough to save the samples. And um, and you know, and so it's 
I'm reminded of the fragility of 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 these samples and the the, it, the need to really take every effort that you can to secure them. And you know, like Svalbard, um, I mean, the, even Svalbard had a hiccup. Um, they had rain enter uh, the, the 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 mine after a few years of uh, after it formed, and they had to then um, waterproof certain areas of Svalbard and close it up. So, I mean, nothing's really ever perfect, but you try and think of as many things um, that can help secure these samples and do the best that you can. And a, a passive biorepository where you don't have to add a lot of energy is really a great way to go. Now, that doesn't preclude having an active one. You could have a second one on the moon that, you know, astronauts use and they, you, there's there's food resources there and, you know, can they can take them in and out and, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it, it's it's... It's your it's your last resort. You want to keep that really really secure, and having that in an area where you just don't have to worry about it. I mean, obviously, it could get hit by a crater. Um, it could get hit by you know all sorts of things. But you know, not having to have energy is a really good thing. And I'm also reminded about Katrina when Katrina happened in New Orleans. Every single biorepository, whether it was a wildlife biorepository or a human biorepository, was destroyed. Oh wow! Was it just loss of power for over a prolonged yes. period of time? It just yes. destroyed everything. Yes. Oh my goodness, that's that's terrible. I've never I've yeah. never heard that story before. Yes, yes, it was really horrible. And some people stayed back, you know, and tried to keep things going. But after a while, there's just no liquid nitrogen available, you know, and um, so. Yeah, there it goes. That's, yeah. that's that's terrible to hear. Yeah. Um, so yeah. th thinking about, you know, what would actually be sent to such a biorepository, how much do you need to send? I mean, obviously, we were talking about, you know, human embryos earlier, and those are uh, obviously quite small. Um, how much do you need to preserve and how many samples of a given species would you want to bring to such a repository? Yeah, those are those are really good questions. And, you know, to a large extent, we, we don't really have the answers for that right now because it, it is a it is a question that you bring to your community sure. and you ask them, you know, but but to some extent, um, we, we have thought about it. And um, uh, the for wildlife, we don't really know how to cry preserve a lot of wildlife. Um, humans, we know how to cry preserve sperm and eggs and embryos. That's not true for most wildlife. We can only cry preserve sperm really for, for, for some wildlife and not all of it. But there are cells and there and um, it's a really easy way to sample uh, wildlife. Um, and that is by taking skin cells. And, and you can do that very easily by for, we did we started taking some some samples just as kind of a proof of concept. And um, we clipped fins from fish. Um, for example, you, you you could use a dart and, and you know, uh, take a tiny little punch from a, a cheater or something like that. Um, there are very easy ways to take skin samples, and and actually, one of um, part of our our group is um, uh, is Neon, um, and um, the um, that's the National Environmental Observatory Network, and they are in fifty states around the um, country, and they are sampling different populations of of, of um, animals, and um, they are looking at changes in the ecosystem. It's it's funded by NSF, and it's a hundred year project. So um, we have like this network that we could really start with. And um, if we take skin cells, they have within the skin cells these these cells called fibroblasts, and fibroblast cells um, can be transformed into germ germplasm cells. They can be turned into stem cells. And transformed into germplasm cells. So they're excellent cells to take for this project. And we know how to cryopreserve them generally because they're all my pretty much the, the same. And all, all, I mean, there's probably slight differences between fish fibroblasts and human, but they're not largely different. You know, they're 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 just minor minor changes you'd have to make. So we have a unified type of cell at least to start with. We have a way we want to cryopreserve them. Um, we don't have um, we don't have the material that we're going to put them in the packaging, and we don't have the, the sort of little radiation proof um, containers we're going to send them in. But all of that will happen as we um, get more partners and um, we do more testing here on Earth to look at. Um, it's a, it's a three day trip to the moon. Um, it, there could be delays in getting the material, you know, into you know into a, a site where they would be safe. So, you know, you think, okay, let's let's imagine six months of radiation. What would that look like? How would that change the cells? And so we can do all of that here on Earth. 
And um, then we can, if we can work fast enough and get money to do it, we'll hopefully get up into the ISS and try it there as well. And then we bring them back down and we say, okay, did they do as well as the cells that are, you know, their partners here on earth that were just kept, you know, in liquid nitrogen. So we have ways to test them. And that obviously doesn't tell you what they're going to look like a hundred years from now. But, you know, I, I, I think about the Panama Canal often when I'm thinking about this project because, you know, the people who built the Panama Canal, um, I lived in Panama for a while when I was in graduate school and I always was in awe of the, the, the engineering of the Panama Canal because boats could use that canal for a hundred years and they had no idea how big boats would get. And yet the, the locks were large enough for those boats to go through for a hundred years. And so, you know, we want to be thinking a hundred years or more into the future. And so, our, we need to be planning, um, you know, the best that we can for that future. Yeah, and it sounds like a, the kind of situation in which you you more or less have to plan without being able to necessarily see around every corner. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, could you tell me how the the starry goby plays into this as a you know, perhaps a <laughs> proof of concept species or or that kind of thing? Yes. So, um, starry goby is here in in, in Hawaii. It's it's uh, very plentiful. It is a, a reef species. And um, we had already cryopreserved different parts, different aspects of the starry goby. Mm -hmm. So we knew a great deal about how to cryopreserve it. And there was already um, very good literature on how to cryopreserve um, skin cells from fish and how to cryopreserve the fibroblasts fr from those fish. So we thought it was a really good model um, to work on. Um, uh, and, and my collaborator, Lynn Prenti at the Natural History Museum at Smithsonian was here and we decided to just do it. We, you know, they're easy to collect. We had a permit. Um, we cryopreserved them and she took them back to natural history. And so the fins, the cryopreserved fins um, are in the Natural History Museum. And um, we are just waiting to get some funds to be able to extract the fibroblast cells, re cryopreserve those, and then hopefully test those, you know, for radiation and microgravity. And would, the, and would then the ultimate goal be to sort of wake them up again from that cryopreservation and, you know, I, I don't know if clone is the right word. Oh yes, you, what you do is you wake them up and you and you see whether they can do um, the same thing that other sort of uncryopreserved and unradiated fibroblast cells um, do. They have are they in, in, intact? Um, do they have any genetic damage? Do they have any cellular damage? So you just you know you 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 probe them as you would a, a human that might have gotten some disease. You know you sort of look at different characteristics of their cells and you ask. How do they look? And you give them a score and, and you know, and if if it doesn't look good, then you have to change your packaging. Um, they're, they're, the, the, the biggest thing in going into space is having the right radiation packaging. And um, so the best thing is lead or water. And those are very heavy, even like some medical, um, you know, machines that have a radiation source use large um, blocks of lead to block that from, you know, causing problems from users. Um, and um, so you can't just launch bl blocks of lead into space. That doesn't work, <laughs> right. you know? And so having something um, that works well, and there's some newer, there's, I'm not an expert in, in, it's called radiation hardening, but I'm not an expert at all in it. But there are some new materials that will allow, um, as the radiation sort of enters uh, the, the material, it causes it to, to to sort of shoot off at an angle instead of penetrating through into the sample. And the really interesting thing is that, and I can't remember the designer, so you'll have to excuse me on this, but there's a very fat, famous fashion designer that is designing the women's um, uh, spacesuits who will go to Mars because your reproductive organs are the most um, sensitive, obviously, to radiation because if you damage, you know, your, your um, your eggs or your sperm, you know, that can that can be a bad thing. And um, so they're designing these suits and they're they're putting in all these fancy radiation blocking sort of around around the sensitive areas. And I just think sure. it's really interesting that you know this fashion designer is uh, is thinking about this and it's it's just really I don't know, kind of fun. <laughs> That's fun. That's the same reason you get the uh, the lead smock when you get your Yeah, no, exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. right. But you definitely couldn't take that up to the ISS. I've mm -hmm. talked to a couple of uh, folks who've had their experiments uh, performed on the ISS, and the objective of getting that the weight down was probably the hardest thing that they um, had to endure. Is that mm -hmm. likely to be the same case here? Yeah, I think. It, oh, absolutely. And 
the thing is, I I think there are newer um, plastics, believe it or not, that I think they're 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 seeing they're really trying very hard um, to get them to be uh, more like you know so the properties of lead in that it causes the radiation you know to stray rather than going penetrating through. And the other interesting thing that I think is going on is there are people who are learning to um, how to build on the moon, like how to make cement on the moon using like the moon regolith you know and and so all of these things as as, i mean we are going to go to the moon i mean we writ large humanity will be going to the moon um and um we will be building on the moon we will be living on the moon um so so a lot of the issues that we will have to to face um in in the future for this biorepository will be it will be solved by people as they think about how we can live and and build on the moon. Right. So, I mean, if somebody's going to, you know, that that southern polar region and to extract water, they're also going to have to figure out how to get robots to work there anyway, because. Absolutely. And I say and the south, the southern pole is desirable because it has the only clear, continuous uh, connection to Earth. So in terms of radio, you know, radio, um, the, the ability to communicate, the Southern Pole has the best communications. Um, so it, again, it is desirable for that reason as well. And if there were such a repository, would we envision it being, um, you know, having personnel at it or would we just no. sort of set it and forget it, leave it alone, don't mess with yeah, it? Yeah, no, I mean, the the passive one, I mean, there, that again, that doesn't mean we can't have an active one sure. that, you know, is is, is um, in sort of, it's, it's is dug down very far, you know, in sort of more, you know, near near nearby where the astronauts are living. Um, but uh, this one will be a set and forget. For, oh, it, it, but let me be clear: it doesn't mean you forget and never use it, right? Yeah. Um, so if you could imagine, and and this is, I think, an important thing. Um, I was I was talking to um, uh, Ellen Stof- Stan- Ellen Stofan, Dr. Ellen Stofan, who is the um, Undersecretary for Science at the Smithsonian, but she had been at NASA. She was a senior scientist at NASA. And she had asked some of her um, engineers, how much was it gonna cost to get a glass of water from the moon? And and they looked at her and they were just like stunned, you know, because the number was just so astronomical, you know? And um, so the, you know, the, we will go to the moon, you know, people said, well, this is gonna be very expensive and why would you do it? And we will go and the cost, you know, humanity will bear the cost, not only because of exploration, but because of resources that are on the moon and on other planets. And I, I think as we think about um, how our, our Earth ages, um, I think exploration, curiosity, need for resources, all of these things will lead us into outer space. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, let's talk just in closing about, uh, you know, we've something we've probably already been discussing quite a bit, but, you know, more or less a game plan. What's the, what are the next steps um, that, you know, we should be on the lookout for as this kind of gets underway? So um, I think the, the really the next step that we need to do is engage um, the, our a larger community. Um, you know, we've been talking, this all started over during COVID, honestly, we, we, the group that has, has proposed this has never met. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, it's all been done virtually. Um, I, I mean, some of the people obviously have, but not as as one group we've never met, and um, so uh, it would be really nice for us to all meet in one room. That would be lovely. Um, but um, so obviously we need we need a larger community, uh, expand our our, our dialogues, um, get more more um, perspective on different things, um, especially the governance. The governance is going to be very complicated. And um, that could take longer than getting the, the samples up there um, because of who we are as humans. And um, so, um, you know, I think uh, the larger community, um, obviously engaging partners that can help with um, testing the cells um, and you know, getting the cells up into the ISS and testing them there, bringing them back down to earth, making sure that they are okay. Um, so, you know, and, you know, trying to find people with new products that can help with you know the radiation issue, um, but then you know like there there are folks that you know we have to talk to about robots and all sorts of things you know because humans can't go into liquid nitrogen. I mean you eat. I don't know is if there's there there is you know a, a spacesuit that really could you know well maybe I guess the spacesuits go out into space so the, I guess humans could go 
down into some, you know, those craters. But it's unlikely that humans will do it. It'll, it'll be most likely robots. Um, so there's a lot of um, techno technological things and engineering things that, besides the human and governance things that we have to talk about. But um, the biology is, is kind of the easy part, honestly. We know how to do the biology. We can get it. We could get that done in a couple of years. And then it's the question of, as you mentioned, what do we put up there? Um, you know, what is important? How many? You know, and in in the, in the paper that we have coming out in bioscience, uh, we will there is there's a cat there's some categories. And originally we did put species there as as some um, reminders to people, but I think people found it um, confusing and they they found it uh, a little bit the list too small. And then we just decided to take the species out. But you know, you want to think about things that can support life on Earth, such as you know, microbes um, that, you know, um, can terraform um, uh, and, and break down, you know, break down things. And obviously, you know, uh, you want you want an engineering species like coral reefs and, you know, um, beavers and, and, you know, just all, all sort, sorts of, of, of animals that can engineer systems. And, and there's just there's 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 many, many groups. And even though as this small group that we are, we, we came up with a list, list of about eight or ten. There's probably more that we we missed, and that's where bringing in the larger community can help us expand that and and make it more inclusive, um, so that really we are representing the Earth and not just this small little group, you know, on on our uh, Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. This is very exciting, and thank you very much for telling me about all of this. It's been so fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciated you, you taking the time to to um, talk to us about this. Great, appreciate it. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.